بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Inspire 2015My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, it was the 13th year after Nubuwa, the 13th year after prophethood. And it was after 13 years of hardship at the hands of the Quraysh. And it was after two hijras to Habasha, and after three years of sanctions. And it was after the death of Abu Talib and Khadija radiallahu anha. And it was after da'wah in Ta'if and being stoned in Ta'if. It was after all this that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knocked the door of Abu Bakr radiallahu an at around midday. A time which was not common or a time in which it was not common for people to visit one another. They wouldn't visit one another around midday. It was at this time that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knocks his door. And when Abu Bakr radiallahu an understood that at the door was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he was there at this time, he understood that the moment of hijrah to Medina had arrived. The hijrah to Medina, a blast from the past moment that would be a great means of Islam flourishing up till today and up till the day of Qiyamah. A moment that would be used as the foundation of, his, of the Islamic calendar. And Abu Bakr knew as well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to be the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during this historical event. Immediately, a great means and strategy was put into effect. They planned their route to Medina via the direction towards Yemen. Why? Because this wouldn't be the first place that the Quraysh would look for them after they realized that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr had departed. So they strategized. They took a different route. They planned their point of stay till the search parties that were searching for them would die down. They planned a way to receive provisions during their stay in the famous cave of Thawr. They planned a way also to receive intel regarding the intensity of the search parties that the Quraysh had sent out. They wanted to know exactly what is happening with the search parties. How intense is the search? And they wanted to know when the intensity had died down or moved to another place. All this was planned. All these strategies came into effect. They wanted to make an informed decision with regards to when they could continue their journey to Medina. They also had in mind the guide that would be hired to successfully assist their journey to Medina. Indeed, they took the means and they planned meticulously. And as they planned meticulously, the Quraysh plotted as well. For the Quraysh, my dear brothers and sisters, they were angered by the fact that they missed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr. And for those who know the seerah, you would know that they were plotting to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they also had an effective plot in place or what they thought was effective. They had the alleyways covered. Surveillance was in place. They could not understand how he slipped through their surveillance. They were very angry. So now they placed a mighty ransom in place, a ransom of 100 camels, the best camels. Perhaps today, in our time, we would equate it to perhaps 100 red Ferraris, right? This was the ransom that was put in place for the person who caught Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they began to search every route, every gully, every alleyway. This is what they did. And the plot was so effective that they even reached the foot of the cave that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr were hiding in. This is how effective their plan was. But there was a mighty difference, my dear brothers and sisters. There was a difference between 
the planning of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the plot of the Quraysh. You see my dear brothers and sisters, the Quraysh, they plotted and placed their trust in their people's ability. They placed their trust in the plot itself. Their hope for success was created by placing their confidence in their plan, in their abilities, in their personnel, in their search parties. This is where they place their trust. But with regards to the plan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then this plan was built upon the placement of one's trust, not in the creation, but in the one who is in control of everything. In the one who is the creator of everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, Al Wahid al Qahar, Al Ahad, Al Samad, Al Ladi lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. They trust was in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quraysh got really close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were at the foot of the cave. Abu Bakr cries out and says, O oh Prophet of Allah, O oh Messenger of Allah, if these people had to look at their feet, they will expose us. Why did he say this? Because they were in Agar. And Agar is different to a kahf. Agar refers to a cave that when you enter, you have to go into the cave downwards. So when you get into the cave, you're actually at a lower position to the actual mouth of the cave. This is different to the cave in Surah Al-Kahf. The cave of the people of the story of the cave. They were in a kahf. A kahf refers to a flat cave. When you enter the cave, and the inside of the cave is at the same surface level as the mouth of the cave. Like when we enter a bedroom of ours or any room in our home. We don't go downwards, right? The, 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 the surface area of the room is at the same level as the entrance. This is a kahf. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the cave of Thawr and this cave was a ghar. So they were actually downwards. For them to be spotted, these search parties would have to bend down and look inside the cave. So Abu Bakr, he tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if they look at the position of their feet, we will be exposed. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says back to Abu Bakr, that oh Abu Bakr, what is your view of two people that has Allah as the third? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Abu Bakr, as Allah tells us in the Quran, do not be afraid, indeed Allah is with us. This is what happened. This, my dear brothers and sisters, is tawakkul. Tawakkul, my dear brothers and sisters, is an Arabic term. And it is a term found in both the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the English language, we translate tawakkul as placing one's trust in Allah or focusing one's reliance only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what does this mean? It basically means, my dear brothers and sisters, that tawakkul is the understanding that we do not put food on our tables, but rather it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sustains us. It teaches us, my dear brothers and sisters, that it is not our degrees or our skill sets or our abilities or our intelligence that causes outcomes to be, but rather that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who showers upon our matters, acceptance and mercy. And as a result, they come to be. And those outcomes are deemed successful. It is with the will and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not based on any endeavor from ourselves. What we do is a means, but success and all of success is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is tawakkul, my dear brothers and sisters. How many a time today do we hear people say, it is I who puts food on my table? How many a time do we hear people today say, it was my idea, it was my intelligence, it was, it was, it, it was my intelligence and, and quickness that I picked up on a certain thing that the deal went through. How many times do we hear this today? It is I who puts food on the table. This is very common, my dear brothers and sisters. This is not the statement of a believer and it should not be the statement of a believer. A believer is one that takes the means but understands that all success is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And a believer is the one who says, Alhamdulillah, all praises belongs to Allah, the one who blessed us with sustenance. All praises belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who inspired me to be diligent so I could study well and I could perform well in my exams. All praises belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who blessed me with these results. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no power nor might except from Allah. All praises belongs to Allah for the, vehicle, for the vehicle that I drive. Indeed, if Allah didn't bless me with this gift, I would not have a vehicle. And if Allah didn't bless me with the ability to drive, I wouldn't have driven. I'm trying to just mention to you mundane activities, brothers and sisters. That today we turn the blind eye to and we attribute success in them to us when the success should be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.